Good evening. My name is Cynthia Riccio, and I am the Director of Programs and Planning for the New Haven Museum. And welcome to tonight's lecture with historian Eric J. Dolan, author of Rebels at Sea, Privateering in the American Revolution. This event is part of New Haven 250, an ongoing series of programming developed by the New Haven Museum to complement America 250, culminating with the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. The series will highlight inclusive, local, and lesser known stories connecting past and present. So on to tonight's talk. According to Dolan, a crucial element missing from most maritime histories of the American Revolution is the ragtag fleet of private vessels from 20 foot whaleboats to 40 cannon men of war that played a key role in winning the war. He contends that privateers, armed vessels owned and outfitted by private individuals who had government permission to capture enemy ships in times of war were often seen as profiteers at best and pirates at worst, were in fact critical to the revolution's outcome. Armed with cannons, swivel guns, muskets, and pikes, thousands of privateers tormented the British on the broad Atlantic and in bays and harbors on both sides of the ocean. Connecticut provided roughly 200 privateers to the war effort. Dolan is the author of 15 books, including Leviathan, the History of Whaling in America, which was chosen as one of the best nonfiction books of 2007 by the Los Angeles Times and the Boston Globe, and also won the 2007 John Lyman Award for U.S. Maritime History and was an editor's choice selection by the New York Times Book Review. His most recent book before Rebels at Sea is A Furious Sky, the 500 year history of America's hurricanes, which was a finalist for the Kirkus Prize and was chosen as one of the best books of the year by the Washington Post, Booklist, Library Journal, and the editors at Amazon. It was also selected as a must read book by the Massachusetts Center for the Book for 2020, as an editor's choice selection by the New York Times Book Review, and was the winner of Atmospheric Science Librarian's International Choice Award for History. Rebels at Sea was awarded the Francis Tavern Museum Book Award and the Samuel Elliott Morrison Book Award for Naval Literature given out by the Naval Order of the United States and was a finalist for the New England Society Book Award and the Boston Authors Club Julia Ward Howe Book Award. It was also selected as a must-read book for 2023. Dolan is a graduate of Brown, Yale University, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he received his PhD in environmental policy. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Cynthia. I think after listening to your introduction <laughs> of me, I just I think I need to shorten my introduction. <laughs> but I appreciate that very much. And thanks for everybody for uh, showing up. Connecticut has a warm place in my heart, not only because I went to grad school in New Haven, but also because I lived in Stamford, Connecticut from age nine through uh, high school. And uh, so, and I, well, I can't tell you how many hundreds of times I've traveled in and around and through Connecticut. So I love the nutmeg state. Now, it was late in the day on June 3rd, 1780, when Salem Captain Jonathan Harridan and his privateer, the Pickering, were heading for the friendly port of Bilbao, Spain. The British privateer Achilles, however, was standing in the way. Nobody would have faulted Harridan if he had fled in the face of this superior foe. While the Pickering had a crew of 38 men and 16 cannons, the Achilles had a crew of about 130 men and uh, 43 cannons. So it was hardly a fair fight, but that's not how Harridan saw it. Turning to the British prisoner who had told Harridan how powerful the Achilles was, he calmly said, I shan't run from her. And he didn't. As the Achilles began its advance, Harridan told his men that though the Achilles appeared to be superior to them in force, he had no doubt that they should beat her off if they were firm and steady and did not throw away their fire. 
Meanwhile, in Bilbao, which you can see a picture of here, uh, which is a fairly sizable uh, town, in Bilbao, word spread that there was about to be this massive maritime battle offshore, and about a thousand people rushed to the beach to watch, watch the spectacle. Booming broadsides and musket fire filled the air. One of Harridan's crew said that while shot flew around him, Harridan was as, as calm as if he was in amidst a snow shower. The battle raged for more than two hours. Then Harridan told his men to put bar shot in the cannons. And that, when it comes out of a cannon, it does grave damage to the rigging and sails of any vessel that is fired upon. Having had enough, the Achilles turned and fled, and despite its injuries, it was still faster than the Pickering and got away. So Harridan spun about, and he reclaimed the Golden Eagle, which was a British privateer that the Achilles had briefly taken back from Harridan. All told, one of Pickering's crew had been killed, his head sheared off by a cannonball, and eight of them were severely injured. Now, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this plaque. This is the upper third of a plaque that is about four feet tall and two and a half feet wide. It was placed in Salem in 1909 by the Sons of the American Revolution to honor the Pickering and Jonathan Harridan and his heroic exploits during the war. While I was working on the book, I read about this plaque and it said that it was at an intersection in Salem. So this is in the height of COVID. I hopped on my bike. I live in Marblehead, Massachusetts, which is right next to Salem. I biked over to Salem. I got off at this intersection. I walked around to all of the houses in the intersection. And while I found some other historic plaques, I did not find this one. So I rode back home and I called a local historian and I said, what is going on? Where is this plaque? And she started to laugh. And she said, it's down the street inside of a Korean barbecue restaurant. So I got back on my bike. I rode back to Salem and I pulled up to this Korean barbecue restaurant and I walked in the door. The woman was very excited to see me there because she probably hadn't had a customer for a couple of days. But unfortunately, I told her I wasn't there for food. I was here to see the plaque that was on the wall behind her shoulders. And nobody has any idea how the plaque ended up there. But I think that its placement is symbolic of, a, of how privateering has been treated in American history. It's sort of been shunted aside and not in the forefront. Now, Harridan remained in Bilbao for two months before he headed back to Salem. Going across the Atlantic, true to form, Harridan captured three more British merchant ships and brought them into Salem. To honor their intrepid captain, the owners of the Pickering gave him this silver tankard and two identical mugs, which were inscribed with the image of the Pickering and his initials to honor him and thank him for his, uh, his uh, success. During his tenure in the Massachusetts Navy and as a privateer, Harridan took many prizes and brought back hundreds of prisoners and as many cannons. He died of tuberculosis at the age of 59 in 1803. His obituary in the Salem Gazette lauded him as one of the most able and valiant naval commanders that the war had produced. The Pickering was one of nearly 2,000 American privateers and Harridan was one of perhaps 30 to 40,000 privateersmen who were on those ships during the war. Privateers were armed vessels owned and outfitted by private individuals who had government permission to capture enemy ships during times of war. That permission came in the form of a letter of mark, which is a formal legal document that gave the bearer the right to attack enemy ships and bring them back to port as prizes or the spoils of war. The proceeds from the auction of these prizes were in turn split between the owners of the privateers and the men who fought on their decks. Despite the contributions made by Harriton and tens of thousands of other privateersmen during the war, 
Many believe that privateering was a sideshow in the war, and privateering has often been given short shrift in histories of the conflict. Rebels at Sea fills the void by offering a comprehensive account of privateering that demonstrates that it was critical to winning the war. American privateersmen took the maritime fight to the British and made them bleed in countless daring actions against British merchant ships and not a few British warships. Privateers caused British maritime insurance rates to rise diverted critical British resources to protecting their vessels and also attacking American privateers, added to British weariness over this war that never seemed to end, and also played a starring role in bringing France into the war on the side of the Americans, which was a critical turning point in the conflict. On the domestic front, privateering brought much needed goods and military supplies into the new nation. It provided cash infusions for the war effort, boosted coastal economies, including New Haven's, and it bolstered Americans' confidence that they might actually win this quixotic war against the most powerful nation on earth. Thousands of books have approached the American Revolution from virtually every angle imaginable. Rebels at Sea places privateering and privateersmen at the very center of the war effort. It demonstrates that when the United States was only a tenuous idea, they stepped forward and risked their lives to help make it a reality. In fighting against the British on the seas, the Americans relied on four different maritime forces. There were state navies, Washington's secret navy, which only operated for about a year near the beginning of the conflict, the Continental Navy, and privateers. And of these four, privateers are by far the most numerous and the most effective, capturing somewhere in the vicinity of 1,600 to 1,800 British prizes worth many millions of dollars. Massachusetts was the first colony to pass a privateering statute, and it did so in November of 1775. The importance of the Massachusetts privateering law in unleashing the privateering impulse throughout the colonies only became fully apparent in hindsight. About 35 years after the war concluded, John Adams would write that the passage of the Massachusetts Privateering Act is one of the most important documents in history. The Declaration of Independence is a trifle in comparison with it. I, I think today the declaration is probably slightly more important, but uh, you get the idea. Now, New Hampshire and Rhode Island followed suit in early 1776 with their own privateering statutes. And at the same time, pressure was growing on the Continental Congress to pass its own privateering statute so that privateering could take place in all the colonies instead of pursuing a piecemeal approach. And Congress acquiesced, and in March of 1776, privateering was available to anybody in any of the colonies. With their capital tied up at the docks, ship owners eagerly pursued privateering. Privateering prizes brought back provided good goods and ships that they could sell. Many men invested in privateers. Indeed, Privateering spurred a speculative frenzy across the colonies. Among the more illustrious speculators was Generals George Washington, Nathaniel Green, and Henry Knox, as well as Paul Revere. Now, privateer captains would usually be hired directly by the owners of the privateers, and they would receive the largest number of shares uh, from the sale of any prizes that they brought in. Now, to explain what I'm going to say right now, you have to keep in mind that when I wrote this book, it was during COVID. My wife was home working. My son was back from college. My daughter, who's a literary agent in New York City, was back home for the better part of a year. And I'm always trying to get my kids interested in my books. Uh, prior to Rebels at Sea, uh, my son hadn't read a single one of my books, and my daughter had only read part of one book. So. 
I wanted to get her excited, so I called Lily into my office when I found the picture of Elias Davis Sr. here. And I said, Lily, take a good long look at Elias. He was a privateering captain. And Lily took a good look at Elias. And then she finally said, Dad, you know, I could really get into privateering. So I guess all it takes is a pretty face. While crewmen were sometimes known by the owners prior to being hired, the men who did most of the fighting on board the privateers uh, were not, and they had to be invited to join. And one of the things that owners of privateers would do is they'd uh, pay for a local pub to give anybody who would come to this hearty welcome as much grog and liquor as they liked, as long as they signed up in the articles uh, for the privateer. Now, black men served on many privateers. Uh, some were free men. One of those was James Fortin, who during the war was in his early teens. And at age 14, he signed on to the Pennsylvania privateer, the Royal Lewis. Fortin's job was to bring gunpowder from the ship's magazine to the cannons. The cruise was a triumph. When it returned to Philadelphia, it had captured seven prizes that were sold at the docks. Fortin and others on board the Royal Lewis earned some spending cash. He actually gave some of the money to his parents. Now, Fortin was so excited by this that he signed on again to the Royal Lewis, but this time his luck did not hold. Barely a day out of port, the Royal Lewis was captured by the HMS Amphion, whose captain was a guy named John Baisley. Now, fortunately for Fortin, Baisley had a son on board. Well, let me back up a second. When Fortin was captured, he was extremely worried because most people of his complexion who were captured by a British ship during the war would likely be sent to the Caribbean and sold in one of the slave marts. And he thought this was going to be his fate. But Captain John Baisley had a son on board who was 12 years old who needed a companion. And Baisley, for reasons that are unknown, tapped Fortin to be his son's companion. So when they rolled into or sailed into New York Harbor a few weeks later, Baisley gave Fortin a choice. He said, you can either be disembarked here with the other men of the Royal Lewis and be placed on the Jersey prison ship, or you can go to England as a ward of my son, where you'll have money, freedom, and a good education. Well, Mr. Fortin, what do you choose? Now, James Fortin was a true patriot, and he decided to go with the men of the Royal Lewis. And he actually lasted for eight months on board the Jersey prison ship before being released in a prisoner swap. Other black men were enslaved individuals who ran away from their masters in order to gain their freedom. Then there were owners who rented out their enslaved individuals to make money. Now, this painting was at one time thought to be the only known contemporary painting of a Black American privateersman during the American Revolution. And as such, it was thought to be worth about $300,000. It was owned by a urologist in Rhode Island. And whenever there was a book or a, an exhibit uh, that involved information about Black Americans' participation in the American Revolution, he would often get a call and be asked if he could contribute his image to the project. So in 2000, France's Tavern Museum in New York contacted the urologist and said, we have this big exhibit coming up. We would like your painting to be the centerpiece of the exhibit. He said, great. He sent the painting out to a local art conservator. The art conservator took a solvent and started rubbing the hand on this painting and off came the black paint revealing a white hand beneath. It turned out that sometime in the mid 20th century, somebody had determined that a painting, a unique painting of a black American privateersman would be worth much more than a painting of a white sailor, white American sailor during the revolution painted over the, the painting and made it a, a forgery of a, of a type. 
So when the Francis Tavern found out about this, they said, sorry, we're not going to use your painting anymore. The urologist who loved this painting had it repainted black and put back on his in his uh, dining room. And the value of this painting plummeted from $300,000 down to $3,000. Now, many have argued that privateersmen were motivated more by greed than patriotism. Famed naval officer John Paul Jones believed it was nothing but greed. A less cynical assessment views privateersmen as being motivated by a combination of profits and patriotism. And that view is much closer to the truth. The perspective of most privateersmen is best reflected in the comments of a privateersman and soldier named Christopher Prince, who said, looking back on his revolutionary career, through the whole course of the war, I have had two motives in view. One was the freedom of my country, and the other was the luxuries of life. Now, privateers experienced many triumphs and tragedies during the war. One of the most successful privateers was the Hulker, which sailed from Philadelphia, and during a span of four years had 11 captains and captured 71 prizes. During a particularly successful cruise, it captured 10 large Bridget British merchantmen who were brought back to Philadelphia, sold, and generated profits of more than two million pounds. Now, one of the worst tragedies to befall privateering took place in New London in September of 1781, when the chief of British troops in America, Sir, Char Sir Henry Clinton, ordered former patriot Benedict Arnold to attack the town. The assault was intended to achieve two goals. First, it was to draw Washington away from potentially attacking New York City. And the second was to punish New London, this nest of privateers. By the time Ardell was ready to de depart on his mission, however, the potential value of the raid as a diversionary tactic was considerably diminished because Clinton had learned that Washington wasn't heading to New York City to attack forces there. Rather, he was heading to Yorktown to confront General Cornwallis. Nevertheless, Corn Clinton still wanted, in his own words, to annoy the enemy's coasts and endeavor to cause a diversion somewhere. So he sent Arnold, along with about 1,850 men under his command, to L New London with the directions to bring off or destroy the prize vessels, traders, or privateers. Arnold's forces, uh, Arnold's forces left New York on September 4th and arrived in New London two days later. They quickly overwhelmed the town of New London, burning much of it, including many vessels, among them privateers that were tied up at the wharf. Arnold's forces also attacked and defeated Fort Griswold, which was across the Thames River in Groton, Connecticut. It was a bloody battle. In the end, 83 Americans were dead and 36 wounded. As for British forces, 48 were killed and 145 were wounded. Now, one of the most important things that privateers did during the revolution was to help bring France over to the American side. In the early years of the war, French allowed American privateers to use their ports, both in the Caribbean and on the mainland of Europe, to reprovision, hire French sailors to fill out their ranks, and even sell some of their goods. All of this was in violation of treaties France had with Britain, and that plus the damage done by privateers infuriated the British. The Continental Congress sent William Bingham, shown here, down to Martinique, a French colony in the Caribbean, and his goal was to encourage privateering in and around the Caribbean, and he did an excellent job. In 1778, it was estimated that American privateers had captured roughly 250 British ships in and around the West Indies since the war had begun and that trade between Great Britain and the Caribbean, which was its most important source of external cash, had plummeted by 66% from 
on account of these attacks. So alarming were these figures that the Earl of Suffolk urged Parliament to keep them from the public, pointing out the impropriety of acknowledging what ought not to be acknowledged at so critical a period, the weakness of the nation. Meanwhile, Benjamin Franklin, who appeared to be everywhere during the American Revolution, was in France trying to negotiate a treaty of alliance with that country. And he was convinced that privateering was helping the American cause with the French, while at the same time injuring Britain. That which makes the greatest impression, impression in our favor here, Franklin wrote, is the prodigious success of our armed ships and privateers. London's public advertiser asserted that if France continued to allow American privateers to sail from French ports, an immediate war between France and this country will be the inevitable consequence. Now, the critical turning point in the war, of course, was the American victory at the Battle of Saratoga on October 17, 1777. Now, privateering, while not causing a sharp turn in America's fortunes on its own, helped create the situation in which this great American victory could prove decisive in bringing France into the conflict. And it did so by greatly increasing the enmity between France and Britain and also inflicting serious damage on the British economy. Now, arguably the most horrific chapter in the American Revolution, and one of the most difficult chapters in the book for me to write, concerned the British prisons, both in England and in the colonies, and in particular in New York Harbor, where there were ultimately 19 prison ships. Now, American privateersmen made up the bulk of the prison population, both in England and, and in the prison ships. The two main prisons in Britain were called Mill and Fortin prisons, and between them, they held about 3,000 individuals during the war. Now, Mill and Fortin prisons uh, had an annual death rate of about 3 to 6%, which was on par with other prisons of this era. Now, however bad Mill and Fortin prisons might have been, the by far the worst experience that a combatant had to endure was a stay on one of the British prison ships moored off New York City. Between 15,000 and 22,000 prisoners were held on these ships. All of the prison ships were dreadful, but the Jersey was by far the worst. Nicknamed Hell Afloat, the Jersey had been a fourth-rate 64-gun British warship that had been dismasted and basically moored in place a few hundred feet from the land right off of what today is Brooklyn. And here's a picture, a representation of that ship. Just imagine, during its tenure, between 850 and 1,200 prisoners would be on board at any one time the vast majority of them American privateersmen. And they were only given one hour a day to come up and see the sunshine and walk around on the deck. Between six and 12 men died every single day on the Jersey alone. Every morning as the sun rose, the guards would yell, rebels, bring up your dead. And not only would the rebels have to bring up their dead, but they would also have to row them to the nearby land and bury them in shallow graves. One inmate left the following damning portrait of his time on the Jersey. There were about 1,100 prisoners on board. There were no berths or seats to lie down on, not a bench to sit on. Many were almost without clothes. The dysentery, fever, frenzy, and despair prevailed among them and filled the place with filth, disgust, and horror. The scantiness of the allowance, the bad quality of the provisions, the brutality of the guards, and the sick pining for the comforts they could not obtain, altogether furnished continually one of the greatest scenes of human distress and misery ever beheld. The number of deaths on the Jersey alone is staggering. The best estimates point to its being points to it being roughly 11 
1,500 men, the vast majority of which were American privateersmen. By comparison, in the entire war, somewhere between 4,400 and 6,800 Americans were killed in the direct line of action. Now, one of the biggest criticisms of privateering during the American Revolution is that privateers drained valuable manpower from the Continental Navy. And that is absolutely true. Many men chose to become privateers instead of joining the Continental Navy because there was a greater opportunity, they thought, to earn money more quickly, and they didn't have to deal with the rigid discipline that was enforced on Continental Navy vessels. But that doesn't mean that had there been no privateers, that the Continental Navy would have been transformed into a fiercer fighting machine. There are roughly 60 Continental Navy warships operating in the Atlantic at various times during the Revolution. Building and assembling a Navy from scratch would have been a gargantuan task if it was done by a well-functioning, well-funded government. The Continental Congress was anything but, and the Continental Navy came together in fits and start, starts. The Continental Navy's record in battle is not an enviable one. 28 vessels were captured or destroyed, and many others were lost at sea, sold, returned to France, or burned to keep them from being taken by the enemy. At war's end, just a few Navy ships were left. There were, however, some bright spots for the American Navy. Raids on, on Caribbean munitions depots brought back much needed ammunition and gunpowder, and Navy ships did an excellent job of ferrying diplomats and dispatches across the Atlantic. And of course, there was a famous battle that uh, in which uh, Captain John Paul Jones and his ship, the Bonhomme Richard, defeated the British warship Serapis. But even that was kind of a Pyrrhic victory because the Bonhomme Richard sank after the battle. And the main goal of Jones had been to attack the fleet of merchant transports that the Serapis was escorting. But the battle took so long that the entire fleet of merchant vessels got away unscathed. Nevertheless, in July of 1780, John Adams reflected on the fortunes of the Continental Navy. And keep in mind, he was a big fan of the Continental Navy, as he was of privateering. And he wrote, in looking over the long list of vessels belonging to the United States, taken and destroyed, and recollecting the whole history of the rise and progress of our Navy, it is very difficult to avoid tears. The American Revolution was the Navy's first hour, but it was not its finest. Okay, we're almost done. <laughs> In the absence of a powerful Navy, America relied heavily on its privateers. Under the circumstances, that was the best strategy available. Now, on the home front, front privateers contributed materially to the American economy. Privateering was a great economic boon for coastal towns and cities, including New Haven, it kept many businesses afloat during the war and created new ones, as well as new fortunes. And the money that privateersmen earned helped them provide for their families and thereby gave an additional jolt to local economies. Each prize auction delivered a new stream of commodities into the colonies, which were much needed. In fact, in August of 1779, a thankful Pennsylvanian told Congress that privateers have rendered us the most essential services and brought us many articles for public and private use, without which the war could hardly have been supported. There was one privateer, however, who was very upset about his role in contributing to the local economy. He returned home from a cruise in February of 1779, only to discover that his hard-earned savings had been depleted by his wife. He took out an ad in a local newspaper that read as follows, Whereas Elizabeth, the wife of me, 
the subscriber, has run me in debt while I was at sea, wasting my substance by riotous living. And as I am in danger of being further run in debt by the said Elizabeth, this is to warn all persons harboring or trusting her on my account for the future, as I will not pay one farthing from this date. Whether the marriage lasted is unknown. The formal end of the war came on September 3rd, 1783, when the Treaty of Paris was signed. Surviving privateers were transformed into merchant ships, and they played their part in transporting America's wares to distant ports, proudly flying the new American flag. The men who owned and financed privateers, as well as those who had chosen to fight for their country, on the decks of these vessels looked back on their accomplishments with pride and wondered, as did all Americans, what the future would bring for themselves and their new country. And I do want to add, since this is the New Haven Museum who is kindly sponsoring this talk, that right before I hopped on, I, I did take a look at this compilation document from 1906, which lists all the known privateers and who their bonders were and what towns they came from. And there were quite a few privateers that came out of New Haven and many wealthy individuals in New Haven helped support the privateering effort. However, I will say my book does have a number of things about Connecticut in it, but with nearly 2000 privateers, you have to understand that most of the privateers and most of the privateersmen are not mentioned in the book. And I always get this with every single book that I write, people reach out to me did you talk about my great, 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 great grandfather? Or did you talk about this privateer or that lighthouse? I wrote a book on lighthouses. And invariably, I have to break the bad news that no, I didn't mention your family's uh, historical connection to what I was writing about. But even if it's not in this book, hopefully the book, if you have a privateersman in your past, hopefully this book will be of interest to you. And I want to add one other quick funny story that I find funny um, that when, when I wrote a book on lighthouses that has a lot of stuff about Connecticut in it, um, I gave a talk in Newburyport and there was a woman in the front row. And right before I started speaking, she said, do you talk about Plum Island Lighthouse in your book? And I said, no, there were about 1500 lighthouses. I only talk about 165. It's not a guidebook for lighthouses. And she was very upset because she was part of the Friends of Plum Island. And she immediately announced right before I started talking, well, if you didn't mention Plum Island Lighthouse, I'm not buying one of your books. Seems to be a theme in a lot of my talks. People before my talk telling me they're not going to buy my book. But anyway, I want to share that story. Now I have one more. I have one more slide. And I'm very proud of this. This is my new book. It has nothing to do with Connecticut, unfortunately, but it's coming out on May 7th, and it's just a wild book. It was a lot of fun to write, and hopefully it's fun to read. And it's basically a book about five men, two Americans and three British, who were intentionally marooned on the Falkland Islands for nearly two years during the War of 1812. So with that, I am done. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. So just let me know what they are. And thanks for uh, coming to this talk. Uh, I have to admit, even though I'm very glad we have the opportunity to do Zoom, and during COVID, I did probably over 100 Zoom talks. I don't like Zoom. So if the New Haven Museum ever wants me to speak again, I hope we can figure it out so I can come to the museum and be in front of people because I can't tell you how strange it is to be looking at my computer and talking and getting no reaction <laughs> whatso whatsoever. <laughs> but you get to see a little bit. This is my office. This is our converted garage. It used to be a garage. This is where I do most of my work. So anyway, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Well, Eric, thank you. That was fascinating. And I'm 100% sure that the New Haven Museum would love to have you come in person. <laughs> so um, I will email you about that. Okay. <laughs> and I do have some questions here. So I will go back to the first one. Um, what advice do you have for searching for the adventures of specific privateer vessels? My loyalist ancestor, Martin Gay, was a part owner of vessels that were taken by rebel privateers. 
he was held by one. Wow. Um, well, there are a number of ways you can do it. The first and most immediate way, believe it or not, is to get the names. If you have the name of the ship that captured your ancestor uh, or the ship he was on and his name, which you obviously have, or any other information, any other information that relates to your specific story that you're trying to find out more about. And just do some random searches in Google or whatever search engine you like and do it in the books, do it in um, just the the all and see what and and sift through the responses it is, it is amazing how much information you can get online how much has been digitized but there's also if you take a look at the bibliography of my book there are a lot of books not a lot but there are books about pri privateering during the american revolution some quite old there was a book that the library of congress put out in 1906 that lists all of the privateers that they knew of at the time now you were talking about your ancestor being captured by a privateer so it's a little bit different but uh if you know what town your ancestor came from which you probably do there's maybe there's a local historical society um, you could always go to some of the other historical societies if his ship was captured by a, a Massachusetts privateer, for example, the Massachusetts Historical Society. But basically, the key thing is to have some determination, have some key terms, do some searches. If you find something that's interesting, go down that rabbit hole and see if you could find more. And the ultimate thing that you could do, I'm not recommending this because it costs money, but there are professional researchers out there who will help you try to unearth information, both genealogical researchers and historical researchers, but I've never used one other than myself. So I don't know much about that process. But if you wanna email me, go to my website, you can always email me and maybe I can give more direct information if you provide some, some background. Thank you. Um, second question, both tonight and in your book, I saw many pictures and engravings that I had never seen before. Thank you for sharing those. Did you get to pick the pictures that were included in the book? And were there any pictures you wanted to include that didn't make the cut? Yes, every single picture in all of my books, and I'm a guy who loves pictures because I think they help tell the story. Uh, every single picture in this book was selected by me. A lot of them are public domain, but a number of them are owned by organizations. If there are rights associated with those, I, as the author, have to pay for the rights. Sometimes it can cost me up to $200 or $300 that I have to pay an organization to get the rights to use their image. Um, over time, it's been great. A lot of research organizations have decided to start waiving their fees because they realize that a lot of these images are out of copyright and they're actually technically public domain images. But uh, it's a far cry from one of my earliest books, Leviathan. I had to shell out $10,000 out of my own pocket to pay for the images, the rights to those images. Now, when I do a book, I may have to shell out $1,000 or $1,500. So it's a much better situation. But yes, I chose every single image. And no, my publisher didn't say no to any of my images. Now, if I had asked for 200 images instead of about 100, which is how many are in the book, I'm sure they would have drawn the line somewhere. But black and white images, I do have a color insert, but black and white images that are inserted in the text are almost negligible in terms of how much they cost. They may add a page to the overall text, but that's not a major expense and printing them is not a major expense. So my publisher, and I've had the same publisher for the last eight books, has been very nice to me and has uh, supported my, my uh, addiction to paint to pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you, you touched on this a little bit. Can you speak specifically about privateering out of the lower Connecticut River Valley and coastal Connecticut? Yeah, I, I, I once again, I have to, me a couple, you know, I, I don't know the individual stories for every single colony and all the different privateers, but one of the stories I do have in the book that I find fascinating, because uh, it has a connection to Stanford where I grew up or part of where I grew up is the whaleboat privateers. And uh, essentially what happened is in Connecticut, uh, your governor Trumbull, the only crown governor who sided with the colonists, so give him a big thumbs up, um, he 
was uh, issuing privateering licenses to essentially whale boats and dinghies to go from the Connecticut shore over to Long Island and also to capture ships in Long Island Sound and Block Island Sound. Initially, they had rights to go up on land and to take British property. But what happened is a number of quote unquote privateers who had these privateering licenses from uh, Trumbull were attacking patriots in Long Island, Americans uh, who had been soldiers and others, and even killing some of them. So Governor Clinton of New York, the part of New York that was still part of the colonies, not New York City, which was under British control, Governor Clinton complained to Trumbull and said, you've got to rein in these whaleboat privateers who are attacking good patriots and taking uh, their their goods and sometimes killing them and or bodily injuring them. So Trumbull tried to, he added a codicil in their licenses that said, codicil is the wrong word, but they added a provision in their licenses that said, you can't basically leave the water. You can't go up onto land and attack anybody in Long Island. Well, that didn't completely work because there were still transgressions. So towards the end of the war, Trumbull rescinded all privateering licenses. Now, I have to add that a number of those quote unquote privateers who are taking liberty with their licenses, I am sure didn't have privateering licenses at all and were just men from Connecticut who hopped in a boat and went across Long Island Sound and decided here's an opportunity for us to enrich ourselves at the to the detriment of hopefully British loyalists. But if it's got to be an American patriot, so be it. So that was a that was a, an interesting piece of the story for me to learn about. And the, one of the most successful whale boat privateers was a guy named Ebenezer Jones out of Stamford, Connecticut. And uh, he didn't do bad things. He, he, he mainly was a, on the up and up uh, privateer. But there are a couple of other stories in the book about Connecticut. And I apologize to New Haven and Connecticut in general that I didn't put more in the book about Connecticut, but every single colony would have the same argument, I'm sure. I remember I wrote a book on whaling. Uh, well, here's a Connecticut story. I wrote a book on whaling called Leviathan. It was a long book, but New London is a great whaling town, has an illustrious history. So does Sag Harbor on Long Island. I only had a page and a half in my book on New London and a page and a half on Sag Harbor. And I went and gave talks in both places. And I got a lot of grief from the locals <laughs> for dismissing their wonderful history. So I'm just trying to give you more context. But I, every single book I've ever written, I have gotten people complaining that I didn't cover their neck of the world. So I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> So it seems like you have to just keep writing. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> but it, it opens um, up an opportunity for you and the audience to write your own book. That is true. Um, while researching this book, was there a favorite document set or source that fascinated you the most? Hmm. Well, one of the most interesting was the, was the Founders Archive, which is an online um, source that I can't remember who... who the organization, I don't, I don't know the history of the organization, but years ago, basically every single letter written by one of our quote unquote founding fathers and men in the Continental Congress has been digitized and is searchable. So I got a lot of great letters from George Washington, you know, uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and other people where they talk about privateering or investing in a privateer. So that was really a fun source uh, to use. Uh, as for other sources, um, just, just uh, you know, <laughs> I know this is going to sound silly, but I spent about six to nine months just doing research. And I'll, I'm researching a new book right now about the Pacific Ocean, something that happened in the Pacific Ocean. But um, uh, early on in the research, <laughs> I will just sit in front of my computer for hours and hours just doing crazy Google searches on Google Books and just finding little tidbits of information and taking that down and doing a screenshot or writing a note or two and then finding something else. And through this Brownian motion of sort of knocking into things, I find so many serendipitous, you know, fun discoveries. 
And sometimes, especially during the summer, I don't know why this is, but at the end of the day, my wife's still at work at five o'clock. I'll go pour a glass of wine. I'll sit in front of the computer and I'll just go crazy and I'll find, and actually the more wine I drink, the more interesting what I find <laughs> becomes. So I you see, you're getting an image of me is this, I am, believe it or not, despite whatever you may think, just having seen me for the last hour, I am a natural, I am a real introvert. I, I, I it, it took me years to work over stage fright when I was younger. <laughs> And I spend a lot of time alone in this room. And I and so you're getting this image of this guy. He spends a lot of time in his room and he's drinking wine. Don't call anybody. It's okay. It's very moderate. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see if we can get to a couple more. Did the British have an equivalent fleet of our privateers? Yes, the, the British, uh, uh, they hated our privateers. They called them pirates, but they inevitably, inevitably succumbed to the impulse because the British were one of the great privateering nations going back hundreds of years before the American Revolution. So they actually issued probably in the order of 700 letters of, no, that, well, they actually they issued thousands of them, but they weren't just targeting Americans. They were targeting the French and the Spanish and the Dutch who had gotten involved in the war as well. But they only captured around 600 to 700 uh, prizes, but there were quite a few American privateers and merchant vessels who were captured by uh, British privateers. And one of the places that sent out the most British privateers was New York City. New York City sent out almost 165 privateers. So the loyalists in New York City, including five, five women, got together, wealthy women, and they sponsored their own privateer to go give it to those rebels. Now, and, that's uh, a good book about the women. <laughs> yes, the women. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's another comment they get a lot about a lot of my books. And I promise before I stop writing, I'm going to write a book just about women. I <laughs> Actually, that could be a problem now. Years ago, it wasn't, but you know, you gotta, you, you you need to write about what you know about. So I'm not sure me writing a book about a woman or a woman's perspective would go over very well in today's climate. However, I've had a lot of people complain that my books don't have enough women in them, and I promise, I just pick the topics because I'm interested in them, and I write what the history tells me. So unfortunately, a lot of my books have not had many female characters and mm -hmm. there were no female privateers that I was able to find. But behind every single American privateersman, there's probably more than a few good women. <laughs> um, so let's take one, let's take one more. And then it can people and people can email you if they have oh, yeah. additional questions. Yeah. Okay. Just go to my, go to my, uh, my website. It's just my name www.ericjdolan, E-R-I-C-J-A-Y-D-O-L-I-N.com. If you go there, there's a contact page at the end. If you if you write me something there, I get it in my email and then okay. I, can, I can respond to you. And yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. Lately, I must have been put on a list because in the last two years, I've done many interviews with high school students who are writing high school papers on pirates in particular. I got two of those just last week. So I think I'm on a list someplace. I was helping people with their history papers for their, their state competitions. So that, that's been fun. <laughs> um, so one more question and somebody was, was listening to my introduction and they want to know, how did you go from environmental policy work to writing books? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you the quick story. Um, yeah, I, I studied environmental policy. When I was a kid, I wanted to be Jacques Cousteau and be in the ocean, a marine biologist. And uh, I went all the way through MIT, hoping to be a professor of environmental studies. And while I was at MIT, I actually taught two classes and I TA'd about eight classes. And I liked teaching, but I wasn't so a big fan of academic politics. And more so, I was not a big fan of the kind of papers and books that I would have to write hypothesis testing and political science. That wasn't my style. I liked writing the kind of stuff I write now. So after I graduated from MIT, I didn't apply to a single 
teaching job, but I wanted to use my environmental background. So I had a number of jobs in the environmental field. I kept uh, writing on the side. I wrote op-eds for the New Haven Register. I had a bunch of op-eds in the Hartford Current, the Connecticut section of the New York Times. I was always writing. And then I started writing books. And basically at the end of 1999, I think I told my wife I wanted to be a full-time writer. So I started transitioning and, uh, that's a funny word. I said, and I and I, my wife said, if you can put aside a year's worth of your salary, you can quit your job. So it took me about five years of writing, and I put aside a year's worth of my salary. I was working full time. I was waking up early in the morning, like at three or four in the morning. I'd write for a couple of hours before I went to work. My wife gave me. My wife's wonderful. She gave me. Every Saturday, we had two young kids. Every Saturday, I got completely to myself to write. I would write at night after the kids went to bed. And uh, one day in the summer of 2007, she looked at me. We were watching House on TV, and she said, you can quit your job. I said, what? She goes, you put aside a year's worth of your salary. You can quit your job. And it took me about three weeks to work up the courage because it's nice to get a regular paycheck. And I could tell you, being a writer is the worst route to financial independence. <laughs> so I, I quit my job. And the only reason I could do that is because I had saved. And my wife and I are pretty good with money. And she has always earned a lot more money than me. And she's very supportive. So that was helpful. And I will, I will tell you to this day, that year's worth of my salary is sitting in its own little bank account. And I haven't touched it yet. So when I fall flat on my face, we could pull that money out and I could still feed feed ourselves for another year. But um, so anyway, that's how I got into it. And I, I just always loved writing. And even the jobs, the environmental jobs I had working for the National Wildlife Federation, working for the Environmental Protection Agency, working for the National Marine Fisheries Service, working for, uh, I worked in the Senate for, a, oh, I forgot to say, I worked for Lowell Weicker, your old Connecticut senator. Ooh, yes. When I, when, I, when, I took, when I took a year off from college, I was hired as an intern. And a guy named Sam Gadenson, who was a congressman someplace in Connecticut, I never met him, but he helped me get that job. I had to go up and interview with Sam Gadenson, and he wrote a letter of recommendation. So I got this internship, unpaid internship. I went down to Washington, D.C., took a year off from college, and... Uh, after working at a restaurant for about two months at night and working for the day for the senator, I was just burnt out. And luckily, I had written this, the senator's uh, uh, position paper on acid rain because I had taken an environmental studies class. So I had shown I had some value. So I walked into his aide's office and I said, I'm going to have to leave unless you start paying me. And I always remember this woman's name because I asked her if she was related to President Nixon. Her name was Eileen <laughs> Nixon, and she's, she's not. And she said, let me work on it. And two days later, they started paying me. It wasn't much. It was only 90 bucks a week, but it was enough for me to quit my job as a cook and work full time for the senator for about another four months. And, you know, he was a great guy. I didn't I only interacted with him a couple of times uh, directly. Very tall. He's about six foot six. But the funny thing is, he's he was a Republican back then. Today, he would be a liberal Democrat. <laughs> Just how the world has changed. And uh, he was he was an interesting guy. One day, I was in there on the weekend. This has nothing to do with privateering. And the president's office called uh, President Reagan's office. They were looking for Weicker. It was during the AWACS vote. I don't know if you know that those aerial those aerial things. Uh, anyway, they were looking for him to get a vote or something. So I was very excited. I got to talk to the the secretary at the White House. <laughs> okay, well, I, I got plenty of stories. So there's a Connecticut connection. I actually worked for your senator for a, a short period of time. Well, Eric, thank you so much for your talk tonight. It was fascinating. There are many more questions. So hopefully people will email you and please come visit us at the New Haven Museum um, this summer. Um, you know, we would, we would love to have you, um, and thank you everybody for, um, tuning in tonight, um, for more information on our upcoming programs at the museum. You can follow us on both Facebook and Instagram, or you can visit our website at newhavenmuseum.org. So Eric, thank you again. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it.
And thanks for everybody for coming. <laughs> Have a great night, everybody.